Let's go ahead and jump into part two of um, the Roger Coleman case. Brad had just returned home from work to find his 19-year-old uh, wife deceased. He um, called his father and then being just hysterical, couldn't stand there and wait, so he had run towards his father's house. And his father had already been, I believe he was backing out of the driveway. Um, when he saw Brad and how hysterical he was, he went back into his own house and called the Buchanan County Sheriff's Department and grabbed his gun. Um, together then, they returned to Brad's house. Um, Brad stays on the porch while his father, Hezzy, goes into the house. Sees right off the bat again that uh, she is indeed deceased. Um, and, and by the way, the call to uh, the sheriff's department was logged at 11.21 p.m. And the first two officers arrived on scene at 11.25. So Deputy Steve Coleman went into the home and went directly to the spare bedroom. He, he lifted the sweater from Wanda's neck to try to find a pulse, but her throat had been cut so deeply that it nearly severed her head from her body. Um, at 11.31 p.m., Randall Jackson, who was the chief of the Grundy Police Department at the time, arrived on the scene. He looked at Wanda's body, noting that fresh blood was still oozing from under the sweater. He felt her wrist, and he found no pulse, but he noted that the body was still warm. Um, he considered just like Brad had previously, the, the killer or killers might still be in the house. So he ordered that the scene be secured and a thorough search of the house and surroundings be conducted. And then he called for a local doctor who was also a medical examiner, and that was Dr. McDonald. He, uh, Dr. McDonald lived very close by on Slate Creek. So a patrol officer went and picked him up from his house and brought him to the scene. Uh, Dr. McDonald pronounced Wanda dead at approximately 11.45 p.m. And he made a, a preliminary determination that Wanda's death was due to, to the slash wound on her neck. And based on the temperature of the body, the doctor believed that the death occurred sometime between 10 and 11 p.m. He then left the scene and returned, I guess, to his home. Um, in the meantime, Chief Jackson was waiting for Jack Davidson, who is a Virginia State Police investigator. Chief Jackson had previously called uh, Jack Davidson and said that he was hoping that Davidson would uh, take charge of, of the case. So while waiting, Jackson noticed that Wanda's body had stopped bleeding and the first signs of rigor mortis had begun to set in. So although there was confirmation that Brad McCoy had been seen at work and it was known that he left work at approximately 11 p.m., the spouse is always the first suspect. So an officer was dispatched to Brad's parents' house to question Brad. Davidson himself spoke to Brad and verified the hours that Brad had worked at the coal company and he requested that Brad take a polygraph. 
Brad agreed, but that didn't happen for another two weeks, and there was no explanation given for the delay. But Brad had become extremely upset and agitated that evening, so much so that his parents became worried and took him to the uh, hospital, to Buchanan General Hospital, where they sedated him. Now, upon examination of the McCoy home, clues were found as to what, it, what had happened to Wanda. There was a latent fingerprint lifted from, outside, from the outside screen door. And on the front door molding, about three feet from the floor, there was a pressure or pry mark. Dr. McDonald had also said that he believed that Wanda had been dragged from the living room into the spare bedroom. A small blood stain that was on the floor, along with marks and patterns, suggested that something had actually been dragged through it, and probably Wanda herself. And there were blood stains or splatter on the living room wall and on a white lampshade that was on a lamp on the table in the hallway entrance. Other than these er three areas of blood, Nothing but the coffee table and the Coke bottle seemed to be out of place. This led Davidson to believe that this is where Wanda was initially attacked and where she received defensive wounds to her hands. They believed that it seemed that Wanda must have let her killer or killers in. In the spare bedroom, there was a massive amount of blood found. And that suggested that the slash to Wanda's throat had happened there. The position of the body, arms over her head in the direction of the bedroom door, led Davidson to believe that she had been dragged feet first into the bedroom. Her hands were not covered in blood, suggesting that she uh, didn't instinctually grab at the wounds. But there was a black substance coating her hands. And Davidson thought he was pretty sure that the substance was coal dust and that it must have come from her killer or killers. More of the black substance was found on the sleeves of the sweater and on both of her upper thighs. And they placed paper bags on Wanda's hands to preserve evidence and her body was removed at 9.30 a.m. on Wednesday, March 11th. So she was taken to Roanoke, Virginia, for the autopsy, and that began at 8.30 a.m. on Thursday, March 12th, and it was performed by Dr. David Oxley. And Dr. Oxley's findings agreed with Dr. McDonald's preliminary determination that Wanda's cause of death was the wound to her throat. It was determined that the wound was approximately four inches deep and it severed her right carotid artery, her jugular vein, and larynx. The wound was made with a single stroke of a sharp instrument and it ran in a downward motion from right to left. Wanda also had two deep penetrating stab wounds to her chest, one just below the breastbone and one near the inside of her left breast. The first stab wound penetrated her liver and the second penetrated her left lung as well as her heart. These wounds were determined to be post-mortem due to the lack of significant bleeding resulting from the wounds. Dr. Oxley didn't uh, note any traumatic injury to either Wanda's vagina nor her rectum, but he took swabs of both areas to test for the presence of sperm. He did find two foreign hairs that didn't match hers in her genital area. He took samples of blood and of the black substance that had been found on her hands, thighs, and clothing and her clothing was preserved. 
Dr. Oxley noticed that Wanda's fingernails were broken and there was some blood on, on her hands, but he didn't find any significant amount of material under the fingernails. For some reason, he didn't preserve the scrapings for further analysis. Apparently, because he didn't think there was enough to matter. He also didn't test the blood on her hands because he assumed it was from her own wounds. In his report, he did not mention the defensive wounds on Wanda's hands or the large bruise or abrasion on her upper right arm, although these were noticed by Jack Davidson and they were visible in the autopsy photos. Funeral services for Wanda Faye Thompson McCoy were held on Saturday, March 14th at the Big Rock Free Will Baptist Church. That's the church that she attended Sunday school classes as a child. Three ministers conducted the services, including the one who had married Brad and Wanda just under three years earlier. Her body was then taken to Mountain Valley Memorial Park for burial. Jack Davidson received word on March 16th, which was a Monday, that the vaginal and anal swabs taken at the autopsy had tested positive for the presence of sperm. At this time, 1981, science was much less advanced. So rather than getting DNA, the test would give a blood type of the man who left the sperm found in Wanda's vaginal canal. And it was determined that the man was a type B secretor. Only 10 to 13 percent of the population in, south, in the southeastern United States have type B blood. And Brad McCoy was type A. The black substance that was found on Wanda that Davidson was so sure of being coal dust turned out to be organic soil and plant material. No such material had been found anywhere in or near the McCoy's home other than on Wanda's body and sweater. So Davidson was convinced it had been brought in by her killer or killers. As with most murder cases, the first suspect in Wanda's murder was her husband. And Davidson spoke to him first and made note of his clothing and the fact that he had a cut on his left thumb. But Brad had no other wounds or scratches on him and there were no blood, blood stains or tears, tears on his clothing. His demeanor was normal for a grieving spouse. And Brad had plenty of information. He informed Davidson that Wanda had been receiving obscene phone calls for some time. And that only stopped when they had had their number changed a couple of months before. He also said that the last person to visit their home had been Wanda's younger sister, Patricia, known as Trish. Before Trish, I guess Brad's friend and co-worker, Junior Stevenson, had stopped by. And Brad also admitted to having had problems with a neighbor. He said Wanda had been afraid to be home alone at night. And because of this fear, she kept the doors locked and bolted until Brad arrived home each night. He said there was no chance that she would allow a stranger into the home. He said she would have let both his, his father and hers in. But the only other men she would allow in would have been Junior Stevenson, Danny Ray Stiltner, who was her former brother-in-law, and Trisha's husband, Roger Coleman. Junior Stevenson worked at the same plant as Brad. However, Junior worked day shift and Brad worked second shift. But it was a swing type of shift and it overlapped with the day shift. Junior Stevenson was interviewed about his whereabouts the day of the murder, and he said he had been so tired getting home that afternoon that his wife had to actually help him out of the truck. He went inside, promptly fell asleep on the couch, where he slept until the following morning when he got up to return to work. His wife verified this. 
Wanda's sister Peggy had previously been married to Danny Ray Stiltner. Both Peggy and Wanda's mother believed that he'd been behind the obscene phone calls. They said that Wanda also believed this. Um, there was also a rumor that Danny blamed Wanda for the breakup of his marriage with Peggy. Despite these things, Davidson did not interview Stiltner for two more weeks on March 24th. And at that time, Stiltner denied making any phone calls to Wanda, and he denied any involvement in the murder. He said that he'd been with both of his parents at the time that Wanda was killed. He went on to speak about Roger Coleman, saying that he felt it was Roger that caused problems in his marriage, not Wanda. He said that when he was married to Peggy, that Roger would often come to their house and bring liquor. He also said that Roger was crazy and was probably the one who committed the murder. Apparently, as soon as Davidson heard that Wanda would have only let in three men and one was Roger Coleman, he immediately honed in on Coleman as a prime suspect due to his record. He spoke to Coleman about his whereabouts on March 11th before he spoke to anyone else about their whereabouts. Roger provided a very detailed account of his whereabouts the night his sister-in-law was killed. He said he had left for work between 8 and 8.30 p.m. When he arrived at work, he was informed that his shift was laid off without notice. Roger said he talked with another man at the mine, and then he left to go home. He got as far as the town of Grundy when he realized he had left his coveralls in knee pads at the mine. So he turned around and went back to the mine to get them. He arrived back at the mine between 9.45 and 9.50 p.m. He got his belongings and then spent another 10 minutes or so talking to the shift foreman and some other workers and that he left around 10 p.m. He ran into a friend on the road and they stopped their vehicles to chat, and they parted company about 10.30 p.m. He drove from there to a nearby trailer park, Boyd's trailer park. He said he intended to go to a friend's trailer to speak to him about getting the following day, getting together the following day um, to look for a new job. But when he arrived, there were no lights on, so he didn't get out of the truck. Roger said this was about 10.45 p.m. He noticed that the trailer across the way had the TV on, and he remembered that he'd left an 8-track tape there a few days earlier. So he went there instead to get it back. He spoke to the residents there for a few minutes and went back to Grundy. Since he was wearing his work clothes in anticipation of working that night, he decided to stop in at uh, the bathhouse in Grundy to shower and change into clean clothes. To most people, this might not make a lot of sense. But to people familiar with the coal mines, it is perfectly logical. Clothes worn in the mines are completely covered in coal dust. And that dust is thick and black and it covers everything it comes into contact with. Miners will often rewear their um, work clothes for more than a day, maybe the entire week, depending on the person, um, because it saves them from ruining multiple outfits. Um, then the, they'll just all shower and change at the bathhouse, and, and then they avoid tracking the coal dust into their vehicle and back home with them. So, Roger said he showered, put on clean clothes, and put his dirty work clothes in a plastic bag, and he headed home. He lived with his wife and his grandparents, and he arrived home around 11.05 p.m. Davidson noted that Roger had no scratches or injuries on his arms, neck, or face. He asked for the clothing that Roger had worn, and Roger turned them over along with a wet washcloth and a damp towel. The legs of his blue jeans were wet, 
and Roger said they must have gotten wet at the mine. They found two or three small spots of blood on the right leg and a tiny speck on the left. The blood was later determined to be type O, which was the same type as Wanda. Roger turned over two knives to the detectives, and they were inspected, and one, which was a pocket knife with a three-inch blade, was found to have a minute quantity of blood on it. But the amount was so small that it couldn't even be determined whether it was animal or human. On March 13th, they took hair samples from Roger. The pubic hair sample was found to be consistent with the pubic hair that had been recovered from Wanda's body. On April 13th, the grand jury returned an indictment for rape and capital murder against Roger Keith Coleman. He was immediately arrested in jail, no bond. We are going to stop here and do a part three to cover the trial and everything else up to the execution. So I will see you next time. Mm -hmm.